If there's one thing I've always said about the Yakuza series, it's how engaging its story and characters are. Each time I play a new entry in the series, I'm always surprised at how the writers manage to keep the same, if not better, quality for each entry. The same can, of course, be said of Like a Dragon Ishin, but the thing that really stood out to me this time is the quality of the sub-stories and how they effortlessly weave together the themes of the game, and also feel like they're a main feature rather than just filler or side content. Here's why I think Like a Dragon Ishin's sub-stories are the best in the series. Like a Dragon Ishin's ability to inspire curiosity in players about the historical period they're playing in is a testament to the game's immersive storytelling and attention to detail. It's a window into a chapter of Japan's past that many players may not have otherwise known about. The game sparks an interest in history and culture, bringing the player closer to understanding Japan's rich heritage. Although the main story arc offers a broad perspective of the Bakumatsu era and the impending changes for a Japan preparing to abandon its isolationist policy, it's the sub-stories that offer a more detailed and intimate view of this time period. The sub-story Global Fraud sees the main character Ryoma helping a teacher answer questions from his young students about the world map. The excellent thing about these types of quests is that Ryoma only knows as much as the player, so if your geography sucks, then it can lead to some comical situations. It's harder than you'd expect too, because the world map we're shown isn't exactly accurate to what we know today. Obviously this is how cartographers back then had recorded the landmasses we inhabit. This was also the first time I learned of the rising tensions between Japan and Great Britain, something which plays a key part in the main story and is complemented perfectly by Ishin's side content. Several sub-stories involve British travellers that have come to appreciate what Japan has to offer, but they are met with fear and hostility from the Japanese population. Our hero Ryoma, of course, shows these xenophobic people the error of their ways. Naval skirmishes did take place between the two empires, with many characters throughout the game commenting on rumours of black ships on the horizon. When one of these so-called black ships disembarks in Fushimi though, it is little more than a raft with a single seasick passenger aboard. Ryoma must cure this sickly sailor by finding the right remedy, and it turns out sake doesn't help that much. Luckily, an old man suggests a local delicacy, umeboshi, a pickled plum with sour and salty flavours. Not only does it fix the sailor up, but he makes it his purpose to export the treat back to his home country. Another character on the receiving end of Japan's apparent hostility to foreigners is Creek, a man who likes nothing more than to get lost in all the roughest parts of town. Here the game provides insight into genuine reasons for the hostilities, traders taking advantage of Japan's gold and silver values at the expense of the Japanese people. However, our hero realises that not all foreigners are bad news, and he makes sure to communicate this to the thugs in a way they can understand. Creek sees the value in establishing mutually beneficial relationships between Japan and other countries, proving that not everyone is there to take advantage. This message is particularly relevant in today's world where anti-refugee and anti-immigration sentiment seems to be on the rise. The game's teachings can remind us that instead of fearing what's different, we should celebrate diversity and recognise the unique contributions that people from different backgrounds can bring to society. There are many characters in Like a Dragon Ishin whose lives are governed by the class system and traditions upheld in 19th century Japan. One such character is Uchitaro, a Heiazumi, which is kind of the feudal Japan equivalent of a neat. Traditionally, only the firstborn son of a samurai family can inherit, and so being a secondborn son, Uchitaro sees no benefit in leaving home and making something of himself, when he can stay in his room and have his mother cook his meals. Ryoma tries to uncover Uchitaro's passions in life, 
and make him realise that there can still be a place for him in society. He can carve his own path. We learn that he actually has some skill with a sword, but only after showing Uchitaro how this skill can be used to protect the people he cares for, does Ryoma finally convince him that he can move forward. I feel like this substory is also one of many in the game that can be seen as relatable to people today. Like Uchitaro, those in modern society who may feel held back by their circumstances and societal expectations can also find inspiration in exploring their passions. The message that Ryoma delivers to Uchitaro about finding his place in the world is a timeless one and it's exactly the kind of message that the Yakuza series excels at. Several sub-stories got me right in the feels, and I'll Miss You Miho is one such story. It revolves around childhood friends Shinta and Miho, who are forced apart when Miho's father moves away for work. After overhearing an argument between them, Ryoma helps the friends reconcile and say their goodbyes before Miho must leave. The story ends on a bittersweet note, leaving players to wonder if the two will ever meet again. The unexpected emotional impact of this story made it a standout moment for me. Another standout, though for entirely different reasons, is The Mochi Mystery, where Ryoma is tasked with working out which of five men stole someone's packed lunch. Each man gives a testimony, and by that you need to work out which is truth and which is a lie. I fully expected to fail this one, but I played it on stream and found that talking it out with a potential audience massaged my brain in all the right places. It reminded me of what I expected from the Yakuza spin-off title Judgment, but never really got. Yagami was supposed to be a detective, but spent more time chasing or fighting people than solving mysteries. This substory scratched that itch of being challenged beyond the action-packed combat of the game, and I hope to see more like it in future even if it was only a brief encounter. One of the game's many features is the farming, done at Haruka's house. A house that Ryoma promised to pay the debts on, but throughout my playthrough never came close to affording it. It's a look into the rural life of a Japanese citizen, what kind of things they grew, dishes they cooked, and their daily routine. It also plays into a hilarious running joke that many characters have an absolute obsession with veggies, whether it's a sumo wrestler trying to bulk up, a young boy who loves the taste, or a lonely housewife missing her husband. Wait, why does she need an eggplant so bad? I'd be willing to bet around 30% of side characters Ryoma encounters, to his surprise and frustration, are happy if he has some veggies spare, making it a worthwhile trip to go visit Haruka every now and then, for platonic meetings only, as the game likes to stress, Platonic back scrubs, platonic ear cleaning, 100% platonic. My favourite sub story by far has to be Talking Tosa. It's no new thing that attention to detail in the Yakuza series extends to the various and distinctive dialects heard around the island. This can be comparative to the dialects here in the UK. Someone from Wakefield, a city that is literally right next to mine, will usually have a different accent to me. If you go just a bit further south to the dark place, Doncaster, you'll discover a dialect that is rarely understood by any outside of its unhallowed borders. French. You could live in it, I reckon. Sure. French. Shivopoli. Shivopoli. It's, it's got me on front of it. Where? It's, it's me there. Oh, it's me, no, because... No, that was not. That's, no, that One of them is no, he's got your hat on, it's not you. And so, in Like a Dragonetian, Ryoma comes across a man who has fallen in love with someone whose Tosa dialect is just as difficult to understand. Ryoma is from Tosa, so offers a hand in deciphering her letters. Although this plays opposite to what made Global Fraud good, as there's now no reason why Ryoma would get the answers wrong, Here's where I have to give particular praise to the localization team. The way the woman was written was very reminiscent of a broad North Yorkshire or Middlesbrough accent, and in a lot of cases used phrases that my great grandma actually used, unironically. Phrases such as, been a spell, right as rain I pray, in a twinkling, this or this end, 
as is commonly used across Yorkshire. When I read these letters as part of this substory, I could hear them in my great grandma's voice. Your words ne'er fail to touch me are all tender like. It showed once again that great care goes into the representation in these games, and whilst we can still laugh and enjoy the humour that comes of these situations, the comedy comes from a place of endearment. But the original dialect from this story was of course a Japanese one, Tosa Ben, so I felt I should dedicate some time to learning a bit more about it, and if it can really be compared to my own local dialect. After watching some videos and listening to Japanese speakers, it seems the localization team were spot on with this pairing. Both Tosa Ben and the Yorkshire dialect have distinct regional accents and vocabulary that are not commonly used in other parts of their respective countries. Tosa Ben is spoken primarily in the Kochi prefecture of Japan. Speakers of Tosa Ben might elongate certain syllables. Consider how Yorkshire people also say words like snow. We elongate the O and kind of throw the W in the bin. <laughs> Both dialects have a strong cultural identity associated with them. The Yorkshire accent is often associated with hard-working, down-to-earth and friendly people. I love the accent, but I also associate it with racism and chavs. Similarly, Tosa Ben reflects the identity of the Kochi prefecture and its people, and is spoken with pride by those who identify as Tosa Ben speakers, who may be stereotyped as having a laid-back rural lifestyle. The story of Like a Dragonetian's protagonist, Ryoma Sakamoto, is based on the real historical person from the Kochi prefecture, and he's also been the inspiration for many other playable characters in Japanese games. Likewise, we had the true story of Jon Snow retold in HBO's Game of Thrones. Unfortunately, the actor portraying Jon Snow, Kit Harington, is in real life a southern fairy, who forgot what accent he was doing halfway through the show. One more interesting point. Instead of using standard Japanese honorifics like San or Sama, Tosa Ben speakers use Hige, which means beard. This is because in the past, men with facial hair were considered more respectable and authoritative. There's also a unique way of addressing people in an informal setting. Instead of using you, which is anata, in standard Japanese, Tosa Ben speakers use pe or po. Similar to how in Yorkshire we say lads and lasses, I mean, I personally would never say something so ridiculous, but I have heard old men in pubs say it. Now then lads and lasses, I've been a Yakuza fan for as long as that can imagine, and let me tell thee, like a Dragonetian's sub-stories, have gone and toppled my previous favourite in franchise, Yakuza 5. They're now like how else, that attention to historical detail, the characters that just seem to jump right out at screen, and them unexpected emotional punches, it's a recipe for a reap belter of a game. Even if that's not normally history buff, these quests will have the ucked from minute that starts playing. They're that immersive, that forgets they're not a Japanese samurai during Bakumatsu era. And let's be honest, that probably didn't even know what Bakumatsu was before playing this game. But now, thanks to some bloody brilliant storytelling, that can probably sit and have a chat about it with anyone who'll listen. It's as educational as is entertaining, and they can't say that about many games, can they? Now I know what that's thinking. Is it worth playing just for side quests? Well, put it this way. I'd happily play them again and again just for crack. There's no like helping out a seasick sailor with a pickled plum or solving mystery of who stole someone's packed lunch. And if that's not enough reason to give like a Dragonetian a go, I don't know what is. So whether you're a long time fan at Yakuza series like me, or a newcomer looking to be introduced to one of the best series in gaming, this game's got it all. History, humour and art. Just don't blame me if you end up being addicted to it like a proper Yorkshire pudding. I've been Jake of The Retro Perspective, cheers for watching and I'll see you next time.